You're listening to the Psych Central Podcast, where guest experts in the fields of psychology and mental health share thought-provoking information using plain, everyday language. Here's your host, Gabe Howard. Welcome to this week's episode of the Psych Central Podcast. Calling into the show today, we have Dr. Tara Sanderson. For over 20 years, Tara has been helping people learn the skills to live their best lives, specifically specializing in working with people who struggle with perfectionism, overachieving, anxiety, and depression. She's also the author of Too Much, Not Enough. Dr. Sanderson, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. We're really excited that you're here, too, because anxiety is kind of a big topic. It's something that really is discussed among people who really don't spend a lot of time discussing mental health. I've kind of noticed, especially in the last 15 years, that people are willing to say that they're anxious more than they'd be willing to say that they're having a mental health crisis or even depression. It's it's sort of becoming a little bit mainstream. Is that what you're seeing? Absolutely. And I think that anxiety is something that is so relatable to everyone. We've all felt that nervous feeling in our belly and now can start extrapolating out to noticing when I have that nervous feeling and I'm not going on stage or I have that nervous feeling and I'm not going into a weird situation. It becomes much more noticeable. And I think everybody is starting to get that close comparison to what other people are feeling. What I specifically like speaking purely as a mental health advocate is that we used to call this like nerves or butterflies, and now we're starting to use words like I'm anxious, I have anxiety. Do you think that's a a good move to actually call it by its actual name rather than sort of speak about it in like whispers and code? Absolutely. I think that one of the benefits of that is it normalizes it for everyone, that we can have this this global word that we all know kind of what it means. I think there is a little bit of a con in the way that like some people say they have anxiety or are experiencing it in one way and other people then compare themselves to it. And there's this weird, you don't have anxiety like I have anxiety kind of thing. Uh, but I think that globally, Everybody sharing that they're really struggling is a good thing. Whenever people compare their symptoms with one another and do the, I have it worse than you have it, et cetera, I I always call that the suffering Olympics. It's like, what difference does it make what level we're experiencing it? We really should be focusing on the idea that we're both experiencing it. Uh, You know, I lead a lot of support groups and I say, really, how how does figuring out which one of you are worse off help the greater good? How does it help you get better? Uh, And that usually refocuses it. When it comes to anxiety, you did touch on a point that there's a big difference between being nervous about maybe taking the bar exam and actually suffering from anxiety. Can you sort of tell us the difference between just general nervousness and actual anxiety? The way I like to break it down is that actual anxiety, when you look at the DSM diagnosis, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, that is how we kind of define each of the different disorders, is that anxiety, generalized anxiety, is a pervasive issue. It not it doesn't just affect you in one area. It affects you all over the place. There are these thought processes and ways that they think about things that are different from folks who are just struggling with getting ready to take the bar exam or going on stage and doing a presentation. One of the areas that really impacts people, I think, the most is that is the idea of rumination. And that's the area that we think about things in a negative way over and over and over again and kind of beat ourselves up over it. And that's one of the focuses of this show. When I was doing the the research, it was a little bit funny because I was like, well, yeah, I know about ruminating on things. I know exactly what that is. And then I realized that, wait, that's like as far as I got. I know what it means or feels like to ruminate on something, but but that's really it. I I could not define the word rumination. What are ruminations? Ruminations are those deep, dark, negative-oriented thoughts that just won't go away. When I think about things that just won't go away, I think that they are also reinforced by ourselves. So it's that idea that um, I I think I've seen a meme about it where somebody's laying in bed and they're getting ready to go to sleep and they're like, ah, my day was wonderful. And then all of a sudden their eyes pop open and they say, yeah, but do you remember what you said to Sally Sue in second grade? Wasn't that terrible? And then they stay awake all night thinking about what they said to Sally Sue in second grade. Those deep, dark things that we reinforce within ourselves, probably unknowingly and probably unwillingly, but they just stay there and they keep like 
going over and over again in your head. I really love the example of of Sally Sue from the second grade. And I think that a lot of people who have anxiety issues ruminate on conversations that they had earlier in the day. And we just replay them over and over again. Well, if I would have said this, would this have happened? Or if I would have said this, would it? It's almost like we're rehashing the same conversation or argument or disagreement or problem over and over again. And I'm guessing this probably has no benefit to us. In in the example of Sally Sue, it kept you up all night. It didn't actually resolve anything. Correct. And I think that's the big difference between rumination and processing. Because therapists do talk to their clients about we need to process through this stuff. And processing is all about a goal of getting to acceptance and understanding and, and potentially moving towards growth. And rumination is all about just kind of beating yourself up over and over and over again. And again, not probably on purpose, but that's just how it rolls. And it's so important to like differentiate when you're thinking about how to get through a problem. Rumination keeps you stuck in it like a tar pit and processing gets you moving forward once you've accepted it and get kind of comfortable with it. Would it be fair to say that maybe one of the differences is the goal? Like I know that when I ruminate on something, the goal is to retroactively win. Uh, I'm trying to make it better and make myself feel better about what happened. But when I'm processing something, my goal is to make it better. And it always includes steps for the future. Like tomorrow I'm going to sit down and uh, apologize or I'm going to ask this follow-up question or, you know, maybe I did come off a little heavy-handed. It's much more practical and goal-oriented and future-based, whereas ruminations seemed, for me at least, to be past-based. I'm going to fix it retroactively. Yes, absolutely. Rumination is all about the retroactive. It's all about the past. And it's all about almost reliving it in a way, whether it's reliving it to win or whether it's reliving it to just do something different, whether it's reliving it to feel better about yourself. But that never actually works. I mean, because we can't go back and make any changes in the past. I can't do anything about Sally Sue. Who is generally affected by ruminations? Is it just people with diagnosable anxiety disorders or is it, does it expand out? I think it expands out. I think everybody has experienced those moments where they go, dang it, I wish I had said this differently or, you know, or if I could go back and do this differently, I would. And I think that rumination, the, the true part of it that really impacts people is when it goes deep into that dark thoughts of it, of I'm stupid because I didn't say this, or I can't believe that I'm such an idiot because I did this this way. Thinking, gosh, I wish I had done this differently is some good past talk that you can grow from if you want to, or it can lead into rumination. I think anxiety folks feel this. I think depressive folks feel this. I think that people who struggle um, with OCD feel this um, in the deeper, darker ways where it just becomes, I'm bad because I'm terrible because I shouldn't go out in public because. And I think anybody who has ruminated on anything is is probably asking the question now, okay, this is perfect. I I understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I do this. Now, how do I deal with it? How do I stop it? How do I get over it? That is such a great question. And I think one that I see all the time in my therapy clients is they want the answer to this question and they want it to be awesome and easy and let's just do it. And I always have to tell them that I may be disclosing that Santa Claus is not real and they need to prepare themselves. (laughs) Um, It's not going to be easy. You're changing a thought process that has probably been in your head for a long time. And during that process of changing, you have to do things differently. You have to notice things. So the first step is stopping. Stopping what you're doing. The second you notice that you are ruminating again, you have to stop and you have to observe what's going on. You have to look outside and inside. I use a method called SOBER. So the first two parts of the acronym are S and O for stop and observe. And I think that those two are the very first key elements to making a change in rumination. When you find yourself ruminating, stopping what you're doing and observing what's going on outside that's prompting this, What's going on inside that's prompting this? What am I feeling? Where did I go? I notice that a lot of times when I ruminate, I'll be driving somewhere and I'm on autopilot in the drive, like I'm driving home from work or whatever, and I'm in autopilot. So my brain just starts going into a direction where sometimes I'm not an active participant in where it goes. And when I notice like, wow, I'm on autopilot. So I let my brain go in this direction instead of me being purposeful about what I want to think about and where I want to grow and what I want to do. 
that's when I can start noticing like, oh, when I get on autopilot, this happens. So I need to not go on autopilot unless I am prepared to work on some of these other things. When you said that, you know, stop and observe, the first thing that immediately came to mind was that famous Bob Newhart a uh, mad TV sketch where Bob Newhart plays a therapist and a person comes in and, and tells their, their problem that they're having. And Bob Newhart has the therapist says, stop it. That's all you have to do. Your, your, your therapy is over. Absolutely. That'll be $5, please. And I don't give Right. Pay. Yeah, exactly. So you, <laughs> right. And I don't give change. And on one hand, as somebody who's been through a lot of therapy, I remember seeing that and thinking, oh my God, that, I, I should just stop it. I'll be fine. And for like a split nanosecond, I was like, this is excellent. I no longer need to go to therapy because I'm just going to stop it. But that's as funny as that was. And as much as I absolutely adore Bob Newhart's comedy, that's not practical, right? So I imagine that there's probably a, a step like how do you stop and observe, especially when maybe you're not even aware that you're ruminating? Absolutely. And I think that that's, that's the key to this whole process is Now that you know the definition of ruminating, which is to continue to beat yourself up over things, to think about all these dark negative things pretty much involuntarily, that when you notice that you do that, which is the whole first key is that you have to notice it. You have to notice when it's happening. Then you go to step one, which is stop. And the part of that is to really just be clear with yourself that you're not saying, gosh, you're so terrible. Stop doing that. The thought is more, hey, I'm noticing that I'm doing this. And now let's move on to observing why. Where's this coming from? It's asking a new question. It's being curious rather than it's being beat myself up over it again because now I'm doing this thing that I shouldn't be doing. And then that moves us on to B in the acronym SOBER. Correct. So B is all about breathing. I'm a big fan of breathing five times and the breathing five times gives you an opportunity to take space from what you've, what you've seen yourself do which is that ruminating, you've observed why it's happening, and giving yourself some space to get ready to move on to the next step. The breathing just gives you a moment to really connect with yourself. I'm a big fan of some active breathing, so you can just take five big deep breaths. I tend to, when I take five big big deep breaths, tend to hyperventilate a little bit because I just want to move on to the next thing. So doing active breathing, like um, tracing the lines on my hands as a part of the process of breathing. So breathing in as I cross one line and breathing out when I cross the other helps me to slow it down a little bit and really give me the space to sink into, hey, I'm going to do some work with myself in this moment. And I need to make sure that I'm being attentive and purposeful in that. So we have stop, observe, and then breathing, and then now we're to E. E is examine the options. I like for people to come up with five options to dealing with whatever's going on in that moment. So in this case, we're talking about rumination. So they've got five options. I like two extreme options and three regular ones. So an extreme option with rumination would be, I'm going to sit here and ruminate about absolutely everything I have ever done in my entire life that has been terrible. And I'm going to purposely do that. And I'm just going to sit here until I'm done with it. And at the age of 40, I have a lot of things I could ruminate over, right? So that's extreme number one. Extreme number two is I'm going to push down on this gas pedal and drive as fast as I can to see if I can distract myself from this rumination, which both are options. Neither are great options. (laughs) They wouldn't necessarily (laughs) be the best solution to your problem, but you could do them, right? And I like the extremes because sometimes, especially being anxious, sometimes you need those extremes to give you the limits. And then you can find that middle area, the gray area that makes it a little bit easier. I may not be willing to ruminate on all of my things from the last 40 years, but maybe I'm going to give myself a couple of minutes to ruminate and see how it feels. That's a much more gentle, in the middle option. Maybe I think about, I'm going to call a friend and talk it through with them. And just make sure that I wasn't crazy when I said such and such, you know, in that conversation. Um, So that's four options. Yeah, maybe a fifth option is that I'm going to turn on the radio and listen to it pretty loud and see if I can just kind of kick myself out of the funk for a minute. Any of those options are fine. And coming up with two extremes and three middle ground gives you some room to kind of figure out what's going to help me really in this moment. Is processing it through with a friend going to help? Is purposely ruminating more going to help? what's really going to do the best for me at this point. And then this all leads us to the last letter in the SOBER acronym, which is R. The almighty R, which is respond. Choose one. And the truth is, it doesn't matter which one you choose. You can absolutely push the pedal down and do that part of it. 
And I always like to remind people there are consequences to all actions. So you also may get a ticket, and that may be an unintended consequence if you're trying to deal with your rumination. But that's a, that's a possibility. You totally could do that. Any of the options are fine because if they don't work, if they don't do what you were wanting them to, you can always go back and pick some more options and try again. There is nothing permanent about decisions that we make in the area of trying to navigate through some of these ruminations or any other choices. And I think it's really important that we give ourselves some grace in that to say like, hey, I'm going to choose this one and see how it works out. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to go back to the drawing board and pick something else. We'll be right back after these messages. Want real, no boundaries talk about mental health issues from those who live it? Listen to the Not Crazy podcast, co-hosted by a lady with depression and a guy with bipolar. Visit psychcentral.com slash not crazy or subscribe to Not Crazy on your favorite podcast player. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face -face session. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central. And we're back speaking with Dr. Tara Sanderson. When we look at sober as a tool, as a tool that we can use, what barriers might come up to folks trying to use this tool effectively? It's super important that they do, that people do that all five letters. You can skip the breathing, but I just noticed that when I skip the breathing, I don't really get clarity on those five options. People, I have a lot of people who just, who skip the observe part of it and they go from stop to options. Um, and <laughs> that doesn't really work as well either because you haven't figured out the core of what's going on. So remembering the acronym is kind of step one. And then doing all the steps is the other barrier. And how do people overcome that? Well, I have them write it down. I'm a big fan of doing it themselves. <laughs> so when I'm in session with folks, um, I don't have a worksheet or a handout for this method. I make them take out a piece of paper or use the journal that they bring along to therapy and say, we're gonna, I'm going to walk you through writing this down for yourself, and then we're going to practice it a bunch. And that really does help because it's in their own handwriting. They're not just taking home a piece of paper and throwing it on the counter. Like They did it themselves. They've kind of taken that tactile response to getting something new in their head. And then we practice it a lot. I recommend that people practice this on every decision you make throughout one full day for everything from, am I going to put my seatbelt on in the car to, am I having cornflakes or oatmeal for breakfast um, to, do I go pick up the kids from school today? Like that's a decision you actually get to make. Now, I will also say, please pick up your children from school, but <laughs> you get choices in that. And I think that the more we recognize that every single thing is a choice from do I brush my teeth today to taking a shower, to wearing a seatbelt, to driving the speed limit, and we notice and make those intentionally, the more we are able to then make other decisions intentionally, like, am I going to sit here and perseverate on something that happened in second grade? No, I am not. That is not how I intentionally want to use my time today. So I'm going to choose to do something different. It's interesting that you pointed out that so many of the decisions that we feel are requirements, we have to, are actually choices that we make. Now, as you pointed out, we, we absolutely want to care for our kids in, in the best manner possible, but we could choose not to. And in fact, we are aware that some people do choose not to. Does looking at every choice as an intentional choice give us more power and, and help with things like anxiety and ruminations, or is it all a big distraction? It seems really weird to say to most people, hey, you don't have to pick up your kids from school if you don't want to. I think that it, it isn't necessarily all about power, but it is all about being focused on intention. And when I think about not picking up my kids from school, well, I don't actually have kiddos, but when I <laughs> think <neither>. about <laughs> picking up kids from school, I think about the option isn't I just leave them there necessarily because you come up with five options. One could be I leave them at school forever and I'm never picking them up. That's an extreme option. Totally a choice, but probably not our best, right? Another one is, you know, I call my neighbor and see if my neighbor will pick them up or ask someone from the school to drop them off or call the school and tell them to take the bus because I don't want to leave what I'm doing to go get them. 
those aren't abusive or neglectful or terrible choices. They're just choices. And I think giving ourselves the freedom to say things can just be choices and I have options decreases the anxiety and decreases the pressure that we are supposed to be doing something else. That I'm supposed to be a perfect parent or a perfect wife or I'm supposed to be doing enough that if I don't do enough, I'm not meaningful or valuable or worthy. And giving ourselves the freedom to say, no, it's all just choices and I have options gives us some just peace. I absolutely love that. And, and Dr. Sanderson, I, I kind of like to flip the script for a moment. You know, we've been talking about how other people can use the sober tool to make their lives better. But how do you personally use this tool to improve your outcomes in your life? So in the book, I talk a little bit about my love of food. Um, and I definitely have a tender relationship with anything sweet or bready or salty, really. It's kind of like all food. Um, so sober has helped me so much in really identifying my connection with why is this food what I crave right now? So there are some foods that make you feel warm and fuzzy. There are some foods that you eat when you're excited. There's foods that you eat when you're bored. And using sober has given me an opportunity to really assess in those moments and not go overboard when I'm not doing that purposely. A big bowl of popcorn, I feel like I'm pretty justified in going overboard on when I'm watching movies with friends or doing a big like gathering. But eating an entire bag of mini chocolate chips is probably not ever really in my best benefit. And yet I totally would do it if I'm not being intentional in that moment. Having a handful every now and then or adding some into your mouth while you're baking chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> like those are all kind of normal-ish things. But when I get on autopilot and I start having a lot of like emotional feelings, especially around rumination of choices that I've made, sometimes that handful becomes 12 handfuls if I'm not being intentional. So giving myself permission to just say like, hey, I'm noticing that I'm feeling really tender right now about a decision I made or about a conversation I had. And what I want is to just dive into the mini chocolate chips in my freezer is that really what's best for me? Let's take a few deep breaths. Let's, add, let's do some options. Do I, do I get out the bag and just go at it? Do I get out a little handful of them and put it back away and walk away? Do I completely avoid it by going for a walk and see if I can get through this feeling without having to eat it? You know, I try and think of a bunch of options and then I pick one. And sometimes it is absolutely, I am willing to navigate this from the perspective of, I'm just going to eat as many chocolate chips as I want. And I will stand there and eat them. And during that process, my job is to then keep checking in with myself. Is this still what I want to do? Are there other options that would make me feel better? Where am I at? Because I know that I can always U-turn. After five handfuls, I can U-turn and say, I'm done. I don't need to eat the whole bag. After one handful, I can. After no handfuls, I can. It's a really nice uh, tool that I use just to try and keep myself in check about what I'm eating and how that's impacting me not just physically, but emotionally. Thank you so much for sharing that. And of course, now I desperately want chocolate chip cookies. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Dr. Sanderson, thank you so much for talking to us about ruminations. I, it, it's really incredible and it's really helpful. Now, your book is called Too Much, Not Enough. Can you tell us where we can find it? Sure. So my book is called Too Much, Not Enough, A Guide to Decreasing Anxiety and Finding Balance Through Intentional Choices. It is on Amazon, uh, hardback, paperback, and as an ebook. And coming soon, it will be an audio book. It's being recorded right now. I'm so excited. That is very cool. And uh, Dr. Sanderson, do you have your own website where people can go and check you out and interact with you? I do. So my website is just Dr. Tara Sanderson, the DR. TaraSanderson.com. And there's a link to my book and there's a link to my practice and you can find out all about me. That is very cool. Well, thank you so much again for being on the show. We really appreciated having you. Thank you again. It's been wonderful. And thank you, everybody, for listening in. And we're excited to announce that the Psych Central podcast travels well. Do you want to make your next event or conference really excited? Meet me in person and have people interviewed by a professional moderator. And then the whole show will go live, extending the reach of your conference. Give us an email at show at psychcentral.com for pricing and information. And review us wherever you find us. Share us on social media. Email us to your friends. 
Remember, we don't have a million dollar ad budget, so you are our best hope for getting information about mental health, psychology, and mental illness in the hands of those who will benefit from it. And then finally, remember, you can get one week of free, convenient, affordable, private, online counseling anytime, anywhere, simply by visiting betterhelp.com slash psychcentral. We'll see everybody next week. You've been listening to the Psych Central Podcast. Want your audience to be wowed at your next event? Feature an appearance and live recording of the Psych Central Podcast right from your stage. Email us at show at psychcentral.com for details. Previous episodes can be found at psychcentral.com slash show or on your favorite podcast player. Psych Central is the Internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website run by mental health professionals. Overseen by Dr. John Grohall, Psych Central offers trusted resources and quizzes to help answer your questions about mental health, personality, psychotherapy, and more. Please visit us today at psychcentral.com. To learn more about our host, Gabe Howard, please visit his website at gabehoward.com. Thank you for listening, and please share widely.